Okay, if you look at uh, verse number 19 there, Genesis chapter 50 and verse number 19, the Bible reads, And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? The title for the sermon this morning is, Am I in the place of God? Am I in the place of God? So uh, this is the final chapter now of the book of Genesis. We're almost done. Can you believe it's been 50 weeks, you know, that we started this series? Almost a year, you know, two weeks short of a year. Uh, I don't know, it just seems like to me that it's gone really quick. I don't know how you guys feel about that. Uh, but I've, I've really enjoyed, I hope you've enjoyed the series so far. And uh, this time, whenever you start reading your Bibles once again, you pick it up and you pick up the book of Genesis again, at least you'll have a lot more now, a lot more knowledge, a lot more uh, thoughts going into your Bible reading. And if you get stuck any place in Genesis, you've got the extra resources now to go back and listen to the sermon online and uh, refresh your memories there. So uh, praise God that we're near the end here. And then after this, uh, after the book of Genesis, we'll be doing three chapters in uh, Psalms, and then we'll go into a new book of the Bible. All right. Now, let's start off in verse number one there, Genesis chapter 50, verse one. And uh, we pick up the story here. We ended up in, in at the end of uh, chapter 49, the death of Jacob or the death of Israel. You may re recall that and the prophecies, the great prophecies that Jacob gave of the future of, of the Israelites. But then in verse number one, it says here, and Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him. So his father passed on. You see Joseph now uh, mourning immediately uh, for his father. Obviously, he loved his father very much. Now, all I want to take out of this first verse is if you go back to Genesis 46, if you go back a couple of chapters, Genesis 46, look at verse number 4, Genesis 46 and verse number 4, uh, the Bible says here, this is when uh, Isaac made the decision, oh, sorry, Jacob made the decision to go back to or to go to Egypt and God encourages him God comforts him and God tells uh, to to uh, to Jacob in verse number four he says I will go down with thee into Egypt and I will also surely bring thee up again and Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes if you look at verse number four just just very quickly there so God says look you're going down to Egypt when you go down I will be there with you you know I will be uh, there but then he says and I will also surely bring thee up again. He says, look, there's going to come a time when you, and by extension, your descendants, your children, will also come out of Egypt once again. Of course, we know that is the Exodus through Moses. And then it says here at the end of it, and Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. And so what we saw play out in chapter 50 is that Jacob dies there in front of Joseph. Joseph, Joseph is right there. As he passes on, Joseph uh, falls upon his father's face. And when God says that he shall put his hand upon thine eyes, you know, it's, it's that, uh, you know, that thought or that idea. When a lot of people pass on, you know, they, they, they die with their eyes open. You know, it's many times people die with their eyes open. And whoever's there, the loved ones, whoever's there close by them, will usually close their eyes with their hands. Before their bodies become rigid and difficult and hard, hardened by death, um, you know, they, they close their eyes. And so what I believe is being prophesied there by, by God is that Joseph will do that. When you pass on, Joseph will be there to close uh, his, your, your eyes with his hand. And we see there in Genesis chapter 50, back, go back to Genesis 50, verse number 1, this playing out, and Joseph falling upon his father's face there, and um, obviously caring very much that his father had passed on. But then it says in verse number 2, And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father, and the physicians embalmed Israel. So to embalm a dead body is basically to preserve that body. Okay, to, to not allow it to rot. And the reason for this, number one, yes, it was the, the, the way of the Egyptians, first and foremost. Now, some people believe what happens here, and I'll show you soon. Some people believe that Jacob was mummified. I, I don't believe he was mummified. Okay, and I, I just looked that up quickly um, just to see the, the practice of mummification by the Egyptians. And it said that it took 70 days to embalm or to mummify a body to help it preserve. And what the Egyptians would do was they I would try to take out um, the, the fluid, the, the water out of the body uh, to help preserve it for a long period of time. And so what we see here, though, is that Joseph does command to embalm or to preserve the body of Jacob. And I believe the reason for this, not only was it a Egyptian practice to do such things, but also because they're going to take his body and take it to Canaan. Okay, they're going to go and bury it at, at the request of, of Jacob to bury his body in the land of Canaan. Obviously, they don't want a smelling, dirty, rotten, disease-filled body 
uh, on their journey. So they embalm it, they, they preserve this body for that reason. And look at verse number 3. It says, And forty days were fulfilled for him, for so are fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him three score and ten days. So this is where the idea of mummification comes from, because it takes 70 days to mummify a, a dead body. And so what we have here, though, is that Jacob's body was embalmed for 40 days. It wasn't even the 70 days. But then they get the 70 days from here. It says, uh, they, uh, and the Egyptians mourned for him three score and 10 days. And so we've got there another uh, additional days there, 70 days, all, 70 days altogether of the mourning. But it makes it very clear that the embalmment was for 40 days only. So it wouldn't even live up, oh, that, it's not as long as it would take to mummify a body, but still, 40 days to embalm his body, okay? Now, you know, embalming a, a body obviously requires a lot of work. It requires these physicians, it requires these servants to do this for 40 days. This is not something you would do to the common man. You know, the, the common Egyptian man would not be embalmed. It's just, it's too much labor for everyone that would pass on. This would be something done for people of high authority, of high power, of, of money and of wealth, of honor and respect. And what we see then playing out here is that the Egyptians respected, they honored Jacob. You know, even though he was not one of their own, you know, they respected him, yes, because of Joseph. Joseph was such a blessing to Egypt, was able to save many of, their, many of them because of the famine that came, was able to, to save uh, the nation, save lives. And so they respected Jacob because of Joseph. But also, I believe Jacob was a very respected man. I mean, you know, he, he uh, in the eyes of Pharaoh, Pharaoh liked him. We may, we may remember that in the previous chapters. And so, you know, Jacob, even though he was living in Egypt, and many times we think of Egypt as the world, you know, we see that, you know, even if you're living in the world, even if you're living in heathen places, you ought to be someone that commands respect. You ought to be, you know, be of good character. You ought to be someone of good honor. And we see these people honoring Jacob by the, by the way they mummified, or not mummified, by the way they embalmed him. And, you know, the dead body there. But look at verse number four. It says here, And when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spake unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found grace in your eyes, speak, I pray you, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, my father made me swear, saying, Lo, I die. In my grave which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan, there shalt thou bury me. Now therefore let me go up, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I will come again. Now this is what I like about Joseph. His second in command of all of Egypt is very powerful. A lot of authority. You know, he's got a lot of servants under him. But let me tell you guys, for the employees, you go out, you need time for holidays. You need to ask for your annual leave, right? And you say, well, I need to go and check with my manager first. I need to go and check if they approve of that. Did you know that's biblical? It happens right here, right? Joseph wants some annual leave. He wants some holiday leave. And what does he do? Does he just take it upon himself to make that decision? Notice that the Bible records this for us. You know, there's a lot of things that happen in Joseph's life. A lot of things. And obviously, the things that are recorded for us in the Bible are there for a reason, all right? And what we see here is basically Joseph being the employee of, of Pharaoh, going and getting his approval. Hey, Pharaoh, you know, if, if you find grace in your eyes for me, I need to take this time off. I need to go back to the land of Canaan for, for a while, go bury my father. Can I have your approval? <laughs> you know, and Pharaoh, of course, says yes. Look at verse number six. And Pharaoh said, go up and bury thy father according as he made thee swear. So Pharaoh gives him the approval. Hey, this is, this is the right thing to do. And you know, I, I think, I think uh, of, of uh, Joseph here, you know, of, of great character. Again, God decides to record this conversation for us because even though he's a man of authority, even though Joseph is a man of great power, he's still submissive to the authority that he's under. You know, and I truly believe the lesson here is that if you want to be a man of authority, then you also need to be a man that understands or knows what it is to be like to be under authority, to respect the leaders, the authority figures in your life first. And if you can do these things, God will lift you up. If you can be under the authority of God, you know, you know, honor God, you know, for who He is. You know, as children, you respect the authority of your parents. You know, as employees, you respect the authority of your managers. You know, as church members, you respect the authority 
of your pastor. You know, God will use you. God will lift you up in positions of authority once he sees you able to be under authority as well. So we see in Joseph, a man of great authority, yet he also knows what it is to be under the authority of others. He seeks the approval of Pharaoh. He doesn't just make the decision on his own, all right? And immediately my thought goes toward, again, I've mentioned this a few times, but your self-ordained pastors, right? Men who ordain themselves pastors, you know, who start churches and give themselves the title of a bishop, you know, takes on that office, but they've not been proven, you know, they've not been sent out. They've not been uh, commissioned and ordained for such a job, but they've done it upon themselves. And they think that they can have a position of authority. They think they can rule the house of God, but yet they themselves were not able to be put under the authority. They themselves were not able to show themselves, prove themselves in a local church, you know, prove themselves to a man holding that office and to, to respect, you know, the, 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 the plan that God has for a man to be ordained and sent out by his local church. Brethren, just a reminder, please, if you find yourself in any church, don't be in a church of a man that has ordained himself. You know, whoever you, 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 know, you decide to put yourself under as a pastor, your first question should be, where were you sent from? Who ordained you? You know, how long were you serving in your church? You know, you know, what were you doing before you became a pastor? Where did you get your experience? Where did you get your training? before you took on the position of the office of a bishop. And if your pastor gets offended by that, that's probably not the man you want to be under. Okay? Because any man of authority like Joseph ought to be able to respect the authority that he came from. You know, or the authority that he is still under. And you know what? Even as your pastor, even though I do have the authority in the church, I still have to honor the authority that I'm under. You know, Jesus Christ is the head of this church. You know, and our authority comes from the Word of God and it comes from Christ. All right, so if I step out of that authority, you know, I'm doing wrong as a pastor. I can't demand, you know, uh, for you to be in obedience to me in light of the church if I'm not in obedience to God Himself. Be careful about the authorities that you put yourself under, especially when it comes to church. You know, the man of God should be the one that knows the most about being under authority, right? He should be the one that is constantly seeking to do what's right in the, in the eyes of God. And if they're not doing that, that's not a man to be under. That's not an example to follow. Self-ordained pastors are not pastors at all, actually. You know, biblically speaking, they're not even pastors. But anyway, verse number seven. I, li- I, like, I like this about Joseph. I like his character a lot. He's one of my favorite characters in the Bible, Joseph. I think he's easy to, to relate to, you know, easy to like. Verse number seven. And Joseph went up to bury his father. And with him went all the servants of Pharaoh. Notice who goes with him. He goes to bury his father, right? But he goes, look, went with him all the servants of Pharaoh. All of Pharaoh's servants. All of them went with Joseph to bury his father. Meaning that Pharaoh was left with no one. He's got like, just take them all. All right? And then it says here, the elders of his house and all the elders of the land of Egypt, all the important people, all the people that have high status in Egypt went to this funeral, you know, on this, on this journey back to Canaan with Joseph. And this is verse number eight, and all the house of Joseph and his brethren and his father's house, only their little ones and their flocks and their herds, they left in the land of Goshen. So only the, the smallest children, babies, you know, infants were left there. Maybe the journey was too difficult for them to travel. But as far as that, everyone else went. Verse number nine, and there went up with him both chariots and horsemen. And it was a very great company. Even the army goes. Even the army of Egypt goes. Think about it. Did you ever get this idea in your head as you're reading Genesis? As Joseph and the brethren go to bury the father, his father back in Canaan, basically all of Egypt is coming along. The great men, all the, all the you know, people of high authorities and powers, and even these army, the army comes, the people on the horsemen. You know, what, what a scene. You know, to see this great, uh, multitude coming out of Egypt all to bury Jacob. That's how much they honored this man. Uh, so it's a huge entourage for this funeral service here. And, verse, and it kind of reminds me, you know, you, sometimes you see funeral vehicles and you see great people traveling behind them. I, I don't see this so much here in Australia, but one thing I would definitely see in Chile is like complete road closures when someone would pass away. You know, you would have the vehicle or whatever it is that's transporting that casket with the dead body. And then you would have the family walking behind them. And then you have the extended family. Then you have the friends. And then you have almost the entire community 
following behind them. I've, I've seen this a couple of times in Chile, these funerals, and it's basically, you can't, you're stuck. Wherever you are, you're, you're stuck. You know, you can't drive, you can't get around, you've got to wait for this mass of people to get through before you can continue on your journey. Um, so yeah, you know, we see this huge entourage and this respect toward Jacob. Verse number 10, And they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond Jordan. And there they mourned with a great and very sore lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. So not only the 70 days of mourning that happened in Egypt, but now when they get to the land of Canaan, they mourn for another week, another seven days. And I believe the reason they do this is for the Canaanites, I I think. Because look in verse number 11, it says here, And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning in the floor of Atad, they said, this is a grievous mourning to the Egyptians. Wherefore, the name of it was called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond Jordan. So the Canaanites get to see this great show of mourning of the Egyptians. And that, you know, and I think the reason they do this again is just to show the, Egypt, to show the Canaanites, hey, this was a great man. This man that we're bearing is someone worthy of respect. And then verse number 12, it says, And his sons did according as he commanded them. For his sons carried him in the land of Canaan, into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, which Abraham bought with the field of, for a possession, for a burying place of Ephron the Hittite before Mamre. So again, that's the same place that Abraham uh, bought a piece of land and he himself was buried there. And uh, many of the family were buried in that same place. Verse number 14. And Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father after he had buried his father. Now notice this, after Jacob is dead, after the funeral is done, after they return to the land of Canaan, what happens to the family? What happens to the family? Verse number 15. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. Is that fair? They've been in the land of Egypt for many years now. You know, many years, at least, uh, 17 years at least. Uh, You know, uh, that's how long Jacob was in the land of Egypt. And here, during this whole time, Joseph has provided for them. Joseph has given them the needs they need, you know, during the famine. Joseph has given them the land of Goshen, you know, a a great place, a a nice place in Egypt. You know, uh, Joseph had done everything for them, but now comes the death of their father, and they think, man, you know, for the, for the evil that we've done to Joseph, you know, we sold him. You know, we, we treat him badly. We hated him when he was just a child. Now that his father, now that the father is dead, surely Joseph will take revenge on us, they think. Surely he's going to come and do evil upon us because of the evil that we did to Joseph. Now, do you think that's fair for Joseph? All these 17 years taking care of his brethren for them to feel that way. I don't think that's fair at all. I don't think that's right at all for them to feel that way. But this reminds me of a proverb. And I, you, I'll just read it to you. It's, it's, it's Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1. And it's, it's a quite a popular proverb. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1. It says, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. What did it say there at the beginning? The wicked flee when no man pursueth. The Bible's saying that when you're, if you're wicked, right? if, if, you're, if you're a sinful person, contrary you know, to the things of God, that you will be afraid, you will flee even when no one's against you. Right? You're going to always think there are people trying to hurt you, people trying to harm you, when no one's doing any such thing. It's just because you have no confidence in the Lord. What did it say there? But the righteous are bold as a lion. Hey, were these guys bold? No, they were afraid because they're wicked. They still had those wicked hearts in them. They thought Joseph was going to hurt them. They thought Joseph was going to pursue them, maybe kill them. And so they're fleeing, uh, not, not fleeing physically, but mentally they're, they're afraid. Mentally they're fleeing. But brethren, we should not be like that, you know? And I think sometimes as Christians, we can have this idea, you know, if, that, does, does, does Satan hate us? Of course, okay? You know, does the world hate the things that we believe and the things we stand on? Of course, but we don't want to get into this mindset and be constantly thinking we're this victim. 
constantly thinking that everyone's just against us, that people are just trying to harm us all the time. When that's not truly the case. You know, if you're constantly having that mindset that, you know, the world is always trying to hurt me, you know, people are trying to harm me, you know, you will be someone that flees. You'll be afraid of things that don't even exist. You know, we've got to be careful about these things. The Bible says instead we should be bold as a lion. If you're righteous, and you are righteous because you have the righteousness of Christ imputed upon you, then you ought to be bold as a lion. You know, we saw in the previous chapter that the lion, you know, Jesus Christ is described as that lion. You know, and that same boldness that Christ had, and he had people pursuing him, he did have people actually trying to kill him, and yet Jesus Christ was bold. Even, you know, even he was able to continue to preach, continue doing the works of God until the time came when he had to be delivered in the hands of the wicked ones. Okay? And listen, if you're delivered in the hands of the wicked, well, maybe that's God's will for you. Maybe that's your time for you to be delivered up. You know, but you shouldn't be afraid. You know, don't flee when people are not pursuing you. And that was the, the fear that Joseph's brethren had after the death of their father. Look at verse number 16. They're so afraid, they don't even go to Joseph themselves. It says here, and they sent a messenger unto Joseph. I guess the thing is, if, if Joseph kills a messenger, we know we better get out of here or something. I don't know. They sent a messenger, right? Unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. For they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, Forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. Now, look, I don't know if this is a lie. I kind of think this might be a lie. I, I, that's my thought. Okay. I, Jacob knows how Joseph has been treating this family, you know, even in, in light of how they treated him. Right? But, but the, the brethren are saying, look, your father said, forgive them. Just before he died, he said these words, you know, make sure you forgive your brethren. You know, and, and I think when we see how Joseph reacts to this, it says, and Joseph wept when they spake unto him. I mean, he, he's not weeping for his father's death here. He's weeping thinking that his, that his brothers would think such a thing about him, that they would think that he would actually try to take revenge on them, that he would try to hurt them. You know, he just spent 17 years living with them, you know, in the land of Egypt. Of course, he's grown fond to, of, of the family, of the children. We see later on, that, you know, he, he's a great uh, uncle to, or great uncle to, to his nephews and stuff like this, uh, to his grandchildren. We see that he's, he's, a great, he's a great man overall. You know, so we see that it bothers Joseph to the point that he starts to weep. And, um, you know, uh, I'll just, if you can, can you keep your finger there and go to Psalm 37 for me. Go to Psalm 37. Psalm 37, verse 21. And I believe the next words that we're going to read is a really great picture of Joseph. Psalm 37, 21. It says here, The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. What do we see with Joseph? Does he show mercy to his brothers? Absolutely, right? He's kind toward his brothers. And not only um, does he show them mercy, but he gives. You know, he gave them. The, the necessities. He's given them the things they need in order to live in the land of Egypt. But verse number 22, For such as he blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. So did Joseph to some extent inherit the earth? To some extent, right? He was actually second in command of all of Egypt. You know, a great kingdom, a powerful kingdom at this point in time. So he was definitely blessed by the, by, by the Lord. And verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. You say, hold on, Joseph was sold into Egypt as a slave. Hold on, he was thrown into prison, was he not? But the Bible tells us here, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Hey, Joseph was a good man, and, it says here, and he delighteth in his way. You know, Joseph, even though he was facing the hardships, he would always you know, look unto God. He was always keeping a close fellowship with God, even during those difficult days. And the promise here is that God will order his steps. And God surely did order his steps in the position that he held there in Egypt. Verse number 24. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. 
Isn't that a great example of Joseph? Did he fall? Yeah, not, fought, not, not really fault of his own, right? But he did fall, but he was not utterly cast down. The Lord upheld him in his hand. You know, Joseph, this is Joseph. This is a great description of Joseph. You know, the brothers are so afraid that Joseph's going to hurt him, hurt them now. But no, Joseph can look and say, no, I've been blessed by God. My steps have been ordered by God. You know, I've been blessed. I've been able to inherit this land of Egypt. You know, I've been given great power and great blessings and to the point where he can show mercy toward his enemies, that he can even give good things toward his brethren that hurt him. So this is not fair, you know, for the brothers to think this of Joseph, you know, to think that he would do such a wicked thing. Look back in Genesis 50, verse 18. Genesis 50, verse 18. It says, And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? Hey, that's the title for the sermon. You know, am I in the place of God? And, the, the con- you know, the context of this question that Joseph is asking is, you know, am I, am I taking action where God ought to take action? You know, am I preventing God from doing, you know, justice and judgment because I'm doing that myself? You know, am I the one in place of God here? And of course, they're afraid that Joseph would take revenge, that he would take vengeance upon them. And of course, this is a passage I've read a couple of times in the, in the teachings of Genesis. But Romans 12, 19, Romans 12, 19 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. What does the Lord say? He says, vengeance is mine. If anyone's going to take revenge... It's God. And so Joseph says, look, I'm not going to take revenge. Am I in the place of God? It's not my place to take revenge on you. It's not my place to take, re- uh, to take vengeance. That's the place of God. That's the place of God. And you see that Joseph does not want to interfere with the place that, of God. You know, he does not want to step in where God is. In contrast to the devil. What's the devil like? He says, I want to be like the Most High. Hey, the devil wants to be in the place of God. Right? God gave instruction to Adam and Eve not to eat of that fruit. The devil comes along and says, well, hold on. Did God really say that? Let me give you some other words of advice here. And the devil always wants to take the place of God or wants to interfere with the word of God. But Joseph is not such a person. He knows that when it comes to vengeance, when it comes to revenge, that is God's place. And brethren, you should never take revenge. You should never seek vengeance from yourself unto your enemies those that have done wrong unto you. And people have done wrong unto you. I know it. People have done wrong to me. People have done wrong to you. And if your heart is to take revenge, brethren, you're wrong. You're wicked. Okay? No, leave it to God. You don't take the place of God when it comes to these matters. God is perfect in His righteousness. God is perfect in His judgments. God will take revenge. Don't worry about it. You know, and these guys, you know, I I don't know exactly in what way, but it seems like God allowed this famine for them to go through hardships. At the same time, God is, was looking after Joseph. Could you imagine if Joseph took revenge? If he had this heart, this bitterness, and he just stewed on this bitterness all these years of his life, I don't think God would have elevated him. I don't think God would have brought him into positions of authority. You know, I don't think anything would have, you know, I don't think Joseph would have flourished the way he flourished if he, you know, was focused on revenge. He allowed God to be in charge of that. And brethren, the greatest, one of the greatest reliefs, or burdens you can take off your shoulders is when you've been wronged, just leave it to God. God knows you've been wronged. You know, whatever way you've been cheated, whatever way you've been backstabbed, just leave it in God's hands. He will sort it out for you. You know, that is His place. Vengeance is mine, you know, says God. So please do not be in the place of God. We're going to keep on this topic as we get toward the end of this chapter. But let's keep reading verse number 20. But as for you, these are the words of Joseph, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. I would really encourage you, brethren, memorize this verse. This was the verse for memorization. Please go home this week and memorize this verse. It'll keep you lifted in spirits when evil has been done against you. 
Okay? When people do evil against you, God means it for good. God's going to use it somehow for good in your life. That's a promise. It's a promise from God. And look, it says here, to bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. You know, God can turn evil that has been done against you in order for you to save people. Now for Joseph, it was to save an entire nation, to save the surrounding people, not to die from the famine. But for Christians, for believers, you are also saving people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have no idea how evil can be done against you, but God can use that to to bring the gospel into the hearts of the people, that people would be saved seeing your hardship by seeing the evil that has been done against you. You know, this is a really great uh, parallel. You know, Joseph parallels Jesus Christ uh, in many ways in the Bible. One day I would like to go for that parallel, you know, just in depth. But, you know, just, just here, obviously evil was done to Joseph and he was able to save many people. What about Jesus? Wasn't evil done against Jesus? You know, arrested, false accusations, beaten, whipped, the crown of thorns, you know. Wasn't great evil done against him? He took on the sins of you, your sins, upon himself. And that's a great evil done on Christ, is it not? You know, the Christ has died for your sins. He took on the punishment, you know, the punishment, the sins of the entire world was put on Christ. And yet, God meant it unto good, did he not? Wasn't that the purpose of God? For good. That's the gospel, glad tidings, good news. That's what the gospel means. And by his death, you know, he was able to save much people alive. You know, eternal life. And so we do have a spiritual lesson that we can take out of this. But not only Christ. As I said, sometimes the people of God may have to suffer for the gospel's sake. And if we are reading through the New Testament, the Acts, the epistles of Paul, you'll often see how people are suffering. The people of God that are preaching the gospel are suffering. But by their suffer, by their persecution, they are able to preach the gospel and see many people saved. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 1.8, Paul speaking to Timothy or writing to Timothy saying, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Hey, should we be ashamed of the gospel? Should we be ashamed of Christ and what He's done for us? No, we should not be ashamed. But then he says, Nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. You know, preaching the gospel will bring affliction. We don't even experience it all that much in Australia. I mean, the greatest affliction is someone cussing at you, you know, trying to put you down, trying to make you feel, you're trying to discourage you. You're not, you're not taken as a prisoner, though. You're not thrown in prison. You're not being beaten. You're not being stoned to death, right? As some of these people experience. But there is affliction in the gospel. And yet, it says here, according to the power of God. You know, God gives us the power to withstand the affliction. So we can glory in those afflictions. So we can share a little bit in the sufferings of Christ as we go and preach the gospel. But if you're afraid, afraid of affliction you're afraid of rejection, you're afraid of persecution, you're never going to do anything for God. You're never going to be able to get out there and preach the gospel. You're never going to have the courage. You're never going to be bold as that lion. You've got to say, Lord, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to do your works. I'm going to preach your gospel, even if it means that I will suffer affliction. And Lord, when I suffer affliction, that's when I need your power. That's when I need your Holy Spirit. That's when I need you to fill me and comfort me and strengthen me so I can continue rejoicing in the work that you've given me to do. Brethren, we may need to suffer a little bit, but by the suffering, by the afflictions, we can save many people here on the Sunshine Coast. We can see many people saved, but all it requires is a little bit of sacrifice from your part. You know, a few hours, you know, a few sore legs maybe after a long walk or walking up those steep uh, driveways. You know, I know what it's like sometimes to walk back home and have those sore calves, right? Sore thighs, Hey, it's all worth it if we're able to preach the gospel to the lost. Back to uh, Genesis 50, verse 21. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house. And Joseph lived an 110 years. And so how did Joseph react? Did he take revenge? No. He treated them well, right? 
He comforted them. He nourished them. He spoke kindly toward them. This is how we ought to treat our brethren in church. This is how we ought to treat not just our family, but our, this is our family. You know, we're, we're brothers and sisters in the Lord. We share in the blood of Jesus Christ. We are of one blood. You know, we are going to experience the resurrection together. We're going to live for all eternity together. I'll see you in heaven. You say, I might get enough of you, Pastor Kevin. I might get the opportunity to preach in church in heaven. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> I don't know. Look, we're going to be together for all eternity. You know, so like I always say, you know, get used to it now. You know, show each other love. You know, nourish one another, comfort one another, speak kindly toward one another, right? Romans 12, 16 says, Be of the same mind, one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. The Bible says that all men, you know, we should go about life, you know, seeking to be a blessing, not just to the brethren in the church, but to even our community, to the people that are around us, our colleagues, our work colleagues, our friends, our extended families. Be kind, be gracious toward the people you come across, but especially your brethren in this church, especially your brethren in this church, because we ought to be of one mind, the Bible says, and that mind is the mind of Christ. Joseph had the mind of Christ, guaranteed for sure. Verse 23, And Joseph saw Ephraim's children to the third generation. Wow, he has a lot of grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren. The children also of Maker, the son of Manasseh, were brought up upon Joseph's knees. So he's a, you know, he loves being a grandfather, doesn't he? You know, he enjoys the grandchildren. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die. And, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which you swear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. So here, we don't have information how long he was embalmed for. Maybe he was mummified. I don't know. Some people believe this. I, I don't know. We don't get the, the amount of days here, but he was put into a coffin here in Egypt. But then later, he, the, the, you know, he made this. You know, he got them to make an oath. So look, I, I don't know. Obviously, Joseph was one of the younger brothers, and it says here that he died 110 years old. And it says here in verse number 24, and Jesus said unto his brethren, "I die." So look. We don't really get much more information about the brothers. You know, the brother, a lot of the brothers were older. So maybe they did outlive Joseph. You know, Benjamin would have outlived Joseph because he was, you know, quite younger than, than Joseph was. Or maybe some of them did pass on and Joseph was one of the last to pass on. You know, one, that's one of the more difficult things to work out in the Bible. But obviously he, he asked them to make this oath. When he comes to, maybe when he's talking to the brethren, him, you know, he's obviously talking to, you know, the children of his of his brothers, so his nephews and his nieces and the grandchildren, all these people as he's passing on. But again, he knows the future. You know, Joseph has been given here, you know, a spirit of prophecy here, knowing that God will visit them in Egypt and God will bring them out of the land of Egypt. Again, this has to do with Moses. If you can please go to Exodus 13 now. Exodus 13 and verse 17. Exodus 13 and verse 17. Exodus 13, verse 17. The Bible says here, this is obviously after, or this is when the uh, Israelites leave Egypt. It says here, And it came to pass, when Pharaoh, Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although it was near, for God said, Lest peradventure the people repent when they see war, and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. But look at verse number 19. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. So this oath that Joseph got them to, to commit to, 
obviously was passed on, you know, through the generations to come. And Moses takes it upon himself to get those bones of Joseph with him. And he carries them out of the land of Egypt. So we see that's the death of Joseph. That's the end of the book of Genesis. And a lot of great teachings there. But I want you to go back to Genesis 50 and verse number 19. The title for the sermon, I just want to pull out some further truths out of this. Genesis 50 verse 19, once again. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, am I for, sorry, for am I in the place of God? And brethren, I don't want you to be in the place of God. You know, to, to, to be taken up a position that only belongs to God. And I had a few thoughts here. Of course, number one, we already covered this was vengeance. You know, not to take vengeance, not to take revenge for the evil that has been done towards you. But what he also says in verse number 19, and Joseph said unto them, Fear not. Fear not. And, you know, this is not necessarily you taking the place of God, but I'm thinking about the coronavirus. I'm thinking about these things that bring fear to the people, you know, to, to our society, even to the people of God. And, you know, we ought not to fear things that can kill you. You know, the Bible says here in Matthew 10, 28, these are the words of Jesus. Matthew 10, 28, it says, And fear not them which kill the body. Look, Jesus says, don't be afraid of the people that can kill you. Now look, the coronavirus, if you get it, it may kill you. It may not. Okay? And look, was the coronavirus genetically modified by human beings and released by people intentionally? Maybe. Probably. Highly likely. Okay? And this is one way that some people are trying to call down the population numbers, even though God wants us to multiply, to be fruitful, multiply and to replenish the earth. You know, the world, you know, the evils, the wicked of this world are trying to stop this process. And look, if, if, if there's, a, there's a fear of death, Jesus says, look, fear not them which kill the body. If your body dies from coronavirus, don't be afraid. It might be the way God wants to take you out. You leave it in God's hands. But what does it say here? It says, but I'm not able to kill the soul. The coronavirus cannot kill your soul, brethren. That's what matters. That's what is going to last for eternity. We're going through the end time series. We're going through the rapture. God's going to give you a new body. All right, don't worry about this body that you have now. Just serve God with what you have now. If you get the virus, you get the virus. You get the whooping cough, which we almost all did. You get the whooping cough. No one died. <laughs> don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, brethren. It says here, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Fear God. And if you fear anything else, you know what you're doing? You're taking that and putting it in the place of God. You ought to fear God. But if you fear the virus, you're putting that in the place of God. Hey, don't put anything else in God's place. Don't put yourself in God's place. Don't put these viruses in God's place. Don't be that afraid. You know, if, if you spend more time talking about the coronavirus than you do about the things of God, you know, you've got, you know, you haven't got things in the right order. Your priorities aren't right. Okay, God can protect you from this virus. If you get it, God can preserve your life. And if God allows it, if, God's, if it's God's will, He can allow you to die from the virus. You're going to die one way or another, brethren. You know, you could die on the way home after church. Driving a car in, in full health. You could be the fittest man in this church. Have no sicknesses. Have no viruses. And you could die in a car crash. If that's how God wants to see you to, to go, so be it. Okay, but don't fear death. Don't fear these things. Even the rumors of death. Don't fear these things. Only fear God. All right, if you fear God, you won't be afraid of these other things. This brings me to my next point here, is that, you know, there's a church that I care about, and they're canceling services. They're canceling church services. Hey, what is church? What is the, church is a congregation, is it not? Isn't it a congregation of believers? That's what church is. You can't have church without a congregation. And this church I'm thinking of, they're having digital services, online services. Don't come to church. We're going to stop having church services here in Australia. We're going to stop having church services, but you can stay home and watch it online. That's not church. You're not having church. You're canceling church. You're canceling the congregation. 
What does God say in Hebrews 10.25? Oh, sorry, Hebrews yeah, 10.25. Not forsaken the assembling of ourselves together. Hey, what does God say? Don't forsake the assembling. Hey, if a pastor says, stop assembling, he's putting himself in the place of God. Now, God said, don't stop. Keep assembling. Say, no, no, but stop assembling when there's the coronavirus. Not forsaken the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. Look at this. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day is he talking about? The day of Christ, the coming of the Lord. We're going through the end time series. What do we learn? Before the coming of Christ, there's going to be wars, there's going to be famines, there's going to be pestilences, plural. But you know what he says? When you see the day approaching, when you have all the pestilences and all the viruses and all the deaths, he says, even more so be in church. Even more so don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Isn't that what it says? Yeah, that's what it says. So look, we should be striving to be in church. That's, what, that's God's will. If I as a pastor said, all right, guys, church, look, I'm not going to cancel church service, even if it's me and my kids. <laughs> I don't care. Even if it's just me. You know, look, look, if you're sick, stay home. You know, there's a proper place. If you're not well, stay home. You know, try to avoid people, other people from getting sick. That's fine. That's important. That's biblical. Okay. But, you know, you shouldn't be afraid of these things. You shouldn't, you know, uh, you know God commands you to, to be assembled together. Even as the day's approaching, even when the pestilences are running wild, you ought to be in church even the more. You should be gathered together with your brethren. I'm not going to take, I'm not going to step in the place of God. I'm not going to reword what God says here, you know. But pastors are doing this. Look, I believe you're safer in the will of God. It's God's will to be in church. Okay, and if you get coronavirus at church, that's God's will for you. You're going to be safer catching coronavirus at church than skipping church and catching coronavirus or dying some other way. <laughs> you, know, you know, there's a blessing, there's protection in the house of God. And if you get sick in the house of God, well, you know, God's going to bless you for being obedient to Him. God's going to reward you. God's going to, to seek your good, you know, knowing that you've done what's right in accordance to His word to be in the house of God, even in the fear of such things. The next thing that I'm thinking about here, again, to do with canceling church and pastor's authority, you know, some pastors do want to be in the place of God. And the commandment that's given in 1 Peter 5, 2, to, to pastors, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being and samples to the flock. You know, pastors are not to be lords of God's heritage. The church, you are God's heritage. You are God's inheritance. And pastors are not to be lords. There's only one Lord over this congregation. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. The pastor is not the Lord of the church. All right? And listen, my authority only stretches in church congregation. Only stretches this far. You know, I, I saw a post recently, and I shared it with some of the men in the church. Right? It said, you know, if you need answers, to, I don't know, I'm just paraphrasing it now, but it said, if you need answers to your questions, go see your pastor. If you need financial advice, go see your pastor. If you need blah, 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 go see your pastor. Blah, 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 go see your pastor. In fact, any this before you make any decisions in your life, you should go see your pastor first, according to this Facebook post. That is so unbiblical. That is lording over God's heritage. Could you imagine if you came to me, and said, Pastor Kevin, should I go to Nando's for my flame grilled chicken or to, or to a Porto? I'd be like, can you get lost, please? Can you stop bothering me? <laughs> but you know, some pastors want that. They want that power. They do. They want to, some pastors even want to, not only your manager giving you authority to take annual leave, but you need to come to your pastor to get annual leave. Honestly. In some places in the world, it's like this. Not so much in Australia, but in places like the Philippines, you know, some you know, American pastors are just like this. They want to dictate and command people's homes. No, I see the opposite. I see the fathers, the, the dads being in authority over the families, over their homes. And if you don't want to take on board what I've preached or you think I've preached something wrong, you've got the authority over your family. You're, you're responsible for your family, not me. 
and I've got to preach, and I guess what? I also have authority in this church, but I have authority in my home, and I have the decision if I'm going to take what's been taught in the Word of God and apply that to my home. I've got the same responsibility as the other fathers in the house to manage their families. I mean, that's taking the position of God. You know, I, I'm not in the place of God, you know. What about preachers that teach falsely? And for many, you know, men here that preach uh, for this church, you know, uh, I trust you, you know. Please don't break that trust. You know, I'm not saying that you'll never say something wrong. I'm sure I've said things that are wrong, you know. But you shouldn't be out here teaching falsely, purposely saying God says something when God never said such things. You know, we find this in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 22, 28. It says, And the prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, seen vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. There's a lot of preachers today saying, Thus saith the Lord, when God has not spoken. I mean, you'll find that rampant in the charismatic and the Pentecostal churches. They're constantly telling you, God said this. I mean, even but in our Baptist churches, you know, and I'm glad this doesn't happen in this church. I hope it doesn't happen. <laughs> but I have people come up to me. You know, God's told me that I need to whatever. A week later, they're not doing it. Oh, God's told me actually this. God's told me that. God's not spoken to you. Stop blaming God and take some responsibility for your own actions. Hey, we're not in the place of God. God speaks right here. This is what God speaks. And if God said something to you, maybe He did, but you need to show me in His Word that He said those things to you. I mean, God says a lot of things in this Bible. If you can't find God saying something to you in here, it's not God speaking to you. It's someone else. Okay? It could be a devil. It could be just your own vain imagination saying some things to you. The other one I thought of here, as we said, fathers have the authority in their homes. And I'll just read to you from 1 Corinthians 11.3. The Bible says, but I would have you know that the head of the man, of every man. So I'll read that again. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. Hey, who has authority over every man? Christ. God has the authority over every man. And then it says this, And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. When it comes to the woman... She has an authority over her, a direct authority. Either it's a father or it's a husband, if she's married. Okay? But the head of the man is Christ. And we have feminism today that wants to take the place of God. Instead of being under the authority of their husbands, they want to be in authority over their husbands. They want to be the head of their husbands. No, that is Christ's place. That is God's place. And we have wives today trying to dictate to their husbands what they should or shouldn't do. Hey, they're trying to take the place of God. Hey, wives, it's not your place to be in the place of God. It's not 50-50 authority in the house. It's 100% authority in the hands of your husband, the hands of the father of the children to have responsibility. Once they say something, you need to go with it. Now look, you can share your concerns. If your husband loves you, he'll listen to you. He'll take on board your, your thoughts, your concerns, and he will tailor the way he, he, he instructs his household with those things in mind, of course. That's what any godly man will do. But once, I'm, once the man has spoken, don't go to your children and say, well, Dad said this, but I say otherwise. And you're taking now the place of God because the only one that has authority over your husband is Christ, and you're trying to be in the place of Christ. Hey, that's not your place. Okay, that's not your place. Ladies, I want, I want the ladies in this church to be different. It is so hard to find a God-fearing woman, a woman you want to marry. Right? I feel, you know, my kids growing up, our, our boys growing up, it's going to be tough for them to find a woman with this kind of teaching in society. No, we need to strive to be what God asks us to be. You know, ladies, you are to be under the authority of your dads or under the authority of your husbands, okay, once you're married. Don't take the place of God. That is not your place. Now, we are concluding Genesis, and just a few more words here. You know, what place does God want you to be? Okay, what place does He want you to be? Obviously, not in His place, but there are places that God will send you that He would want you to be, right? And, you know, just in conclusion of the whole book of Genesis, just thinking back on some of the stories of, of what we've covered, you know, Adam and Eve, you know, 
that's the first marriage. On day number one, they're married, husband and wife. And if you're married, you know, your place is in that marriage. You know, husbands, you are not to look at other women. You're not to dream about what would it be like if I married so-and-so, one of your old girlfriends or something like that. Hey, that should be the farthest thing from your mind. You know, your eyes should not be on anybody else, whether out there in, in, in public or on a computer screen. Your eyes ought to be only on your wives. Your place is in your marriage. Men and women, till death do you part, that is your proper place. That is where God wants you to be. What about Cain and Abel? We find that Cain's faith was in the wrong place, was it not? It was in the place of his, the works of his hands, the things he was able to grow and, and develop. No, our, our faith ought to be on the shed blood that Abel had, you know, that picture that, that, that pointed toward Christ. Our faith needs to be in the right place, on the shed blood of Jesus Christ. What about uh, um, Noah? Where was his place? He found himself in the ark, did he not? With his family. Hey, his place was in the ark. And the ark pictures salvation. But not only was he in the ark, he had taken his whole family, his wife, his children with him into the ark. And you know, fathers, you are the heads of your home. The right place for your family is to be in the ark of Jesus Christ. Salvation. You need to teach your family the things of God. You need to teach the gospel to your children. Don't let your children go to the devil. Don't let your children go to this world. Be someone like Noah that brought his family onto the ark. That is the right place to be. We see Abraham made a mistake when God had caught him to the place of Canaan. He went to the wrong place, didn't he? He went to Egypt and he found himself in a, a whole lot of problem. And of course, when, he, when Abraham returned back to the land of Canaan, he returned back to Bethel. And Bethel was the house of God. Of course, the New Testament church is the house of God. This is the place that you need to be. Not outside of church, not missing church. You need to be back in the place that God wants you to be in Bethel. What about Lot? Man, he found himself in the wrong place, did he not? He pitched his tent towards Sodom. Eventually, he's living in Sodom, you know, became accepting of homosexuality. You know, he let it go around him. I mean, if you were living in Sodom, I reckon you guys would have moved. You know, but Lot got to a point where his conscience was so seared toward that sin. You know, he was able to live there with his family. Man, he found himself in the wrong place. The angels had to pull him out of that place. You know, brethren, you know, when it comes to sin, we can't become accepting of sin. You know, of course, I don't, you know, none of you should be into homosexuality. That's a reprobate sin. I mean, unless you're a reprobate, you shouldn't be doing such things. But that's a wicked sin. But we have sins in our lives. You know, we should not be at a place where we're comfortable with our sins. And it's easy to get comfortable with our sins because we sin all the time. We have the same things we struggle with all the time. And it's easy to get to the point and say, well, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm going to continue sinning, so you stop feeling bad about it. No, you should never. You should never get comfortable in your sins. Every sin you have, you go and confess it to the Lord. You go in humility. You go with a guilty conscience for breaking the laws of God. Ask Him for forgiveness and ask God to help you to overcome that sin in your life. Don't get comfortable in the wrong place. Abraham's servant, you know, he was, uh, what place did he find? Well, you know, in, I would say the place of prayer. Remember, his servant was sent to find a wife unto Isaac. And as he went on his journey, he stopped and started to pray to the Lord, asking the Lord to answer his prayers. And the Lord did answer his prayer. You know, the right place for us is to be prayerful toward the Lord. You know, we ought to find that place in our, at that time in our lives where we are praying, asking for God to answer our prayers. Jacob, you know, he ran away from his brother Esau. He was afraid that Esau would kill him. I think Esau did have that intention to kill his brother Jacob. Uh, but he found the right place. And that right place was making peace with Esau when he returned. Remember that story? When he returned back, he made peace with Esau. You know, and brethren, if you have conflicts with people, the right place for you to be in is to sort out those problems, to sort out those conflicts, make peace with your brothers and sisters, make peace with your family members, whoever it is that you've got problems or issues with, conflicts with. And then we have Joseph's story here. We have Joseph's brethren. They, were in, they found a place in their hearts for envy, right? When their father favored Joseph, when their father gave him that coat of many colors, 
they allowed envy to creep into their lives. You know, we've all been envious, but they've gotten to a point where the, the envy had eaten them up to the point where they wanted to even kill their own brother. And they sold him as a slave into Egypt. They were in the wrong place. And finally, with Joseph, the place that he found himself, again, like I said, was a slave or a prisoner. But even in that place of difficulty, he was able to constantly have fellowship with God. He was constantly able to have that time with God, to, to honor God, to, to, uh, to reflect upon God. And God saw him through his difficulties. So brethren, as I said, the end of Genesis, you know, what place are you in? What place are you in? Are you in the place of God? Are you overstepping your boundaries? Are you overstepping your areas of authority and not allowing God to step in and, and do what God does? You need to give God His place. But also, are you where God wants you to be? You know, we, we've learned some great lessons here in the book of Genesis. I hope you go back and reflect on all, all the things, not just this chapter, but the lessons of the entire book and try to live out, you know, the, the good characteristics that we see in these godly men. A lot of these godly men were very faithful they made mistakes. They weren't perfect. And we saw a lot of imperfections, a lot of problems, a lot of mistakes. But we see how God was able to use these men in a mighty way because they re remained faithful to God. Let's pray.